podcaster in the world, Pastor Bill Hackworth. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. For some reason in this country, we do seem to neglect dads. Amen. I think in this country that if you watch TV, the guys are the idiots and the women keep it all together. They, they portray this idea that, um, that men are just a bunch of overgrown kids, right? But the reality of it is that some of us work really hard and sacrifice our lives for our family. And so I think that we should show some honor where honors do. And I think some men need to grow up. <laughs> Amen? But I think some women can grow up. Amen? Right? But I think it's a day that we recognize dads, and I think we should just do that. We should recognize men that have been influential in our life. Amen? When I think about, I, you know, my, my dad was, had a lot of flaws in his life, but one thing my dad, one thing I was blessed with was my dad always loved me, always showed me love, and loved me unconditionally with all of his flaws and all the things that he had wrong with him. He always, uh, he always believed in me, and he always showed me love, and, and, I mean, my, my little brother and I, we had a pretty rough life growing up, but having that foundation that I was loved, man, it, 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 I, I can't tell you, I, pick on Angel's dad for a minute, you know, she didn't really feel that, and so we both grew up in dysfunctional homes, but her dad didn't know how to show love because his dad didn't know how to show love, and so Angela never really felt loved, and I grew, grew up a lot further ahead in life but just because my dad knew how to show me love. Because I honestly believe in all of my heart that we were created to be loved, right? And so when we talk about that, we can't go uh, on Father's Day without talking about our Heavenly Father, Amen. our Papa. And I, I watched that Shaq here Friday, and I cried through that whole thing. I just sat here and cried and cried and cried. And, man, just God, I, people are offended by that. I don't, I don't understand that. Like. We'll watch the Left Behind series and go, that's good stuff right there. <laughs> and then we'll watch the Shack and we'll say, that's a bunch of junk. I, we, our, our minds are twisted. we got some problems with this. And we watch Death and Destruction and say, amen. And we see healing and restoration and we say, oh my, we got something wrong with us, right? Uh, I, I mean, uh, like, I, I know doctrine pretty well and I don't really think they cross any lines. They might make you wonder about a couple of things, but I don't think they ever cross any lines. I think if we're looking for something... We'll find something. Every Sunday, if you come in here looking for me to make a mistake preaching, you're probably going to find something. If you're coming here trying to get what the Holy Ghost is trying to reveal through me, you're going to get that. And if you come watching the shack or what the Holy Ghost was trying to reveal through that movie, you're going to see our Heavenly Father like He really is. Amen. Loving, a healer. Actually, you know, Jesus said that if, He says that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, right? And so, I, I said this before, and it's kind of it's offended to people, but I say anything that you think about God that you can't find in Jesus, you gotta, you, you're going to have to change the way you think, right? And some people say, well, God in the Old Testament was this, this, and this, and this, but Jesus says that it, none of you have known the Father except for me. So, what we, the revelation that they had in the Old Testament of the Father wasn't a very good, he wasn't fully revealed. So Jesus comes to fully reveal the Father. And so if you think that the Father is about sin and storms and destruction and those things, then we look at Jesus and when the storm came, Jesus ceased the storm. Amen? And so I look at stories in the Bible like the woman caught in adultery and they bring her and they throw her at Jesus' feet. And, you know, I've heard teachings on this and said things like, you know, uh, well, they didn't bring the man so Jesus couldn't condemn her, you know, and because we don't understand that if this girl's guilty, how can Jesus say, I don't condemn you, right? But we know that she was guilty because Jesus says, go and sin no more. So she was guilty whether they brought the man or not. I look at that and I just think that this was a moment that a father had with his daughter and she did need to be belittled. She did need to be beat down. She needed somebody to pick her up and say, I don't condemn you either. Right? And then, all right, that's how our heavenly father. He says, I'm going to do what I see my father do. And he says, what he's saying is, if my father was here and you were caught in adultery, if you were a murderer, if you were this, you were that, if you were what the guy in the shack was, and my father was here and you're still dead at my feet, my father would pick you up and say, I don't condemn you either. Right? Hallelujah. 
I, I heard this joke once. I've told it probably a couple times here. I don't know if I have or not, but I've told it a few times. And this, this girl, she ended up going to, uh, she was like living this rough life, pretty rough life, and she was partying and all these things, and she decided that it was time that she got her life together. And so she showed up in church that Sunday. She got to she goes to go to church, and she showed up in the booty shorts, you know, and the half crop top shirt, right? And uh, at the end of the service, the pastor says to her, he says, hey, next week if you come back, you need to pray to God about what you should wear to church. So next week she shows back up, the booty shorts, but now she's got the fishnet deal on, the boots up to here, you know, and the pastor's sitting there furious as he's preaching. And as soon as he gets there, he goes straight to her and he says, he says, I thought I told you to pray to God about what to wear to church. And she's like, I did. And he says, well, what did he tell you? He says, I don't know. I've never been to that church before. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because if we want to exclude people out of church that God wants to include, God ain't showing up there. Right? There's a reason God shows up here. Because we let all you heathens go here. Amen? That's why the devil don't like us. I've been saying that a lot, but he really don't like us. Why? Because we let all you heathens come here and tell you that you're holy and you're righteous. Amen? Amen? Amen. You guys got to get pumped up today. It's Father's Day. You got to help this... Father, preach. My kids have been keeping me up late every night. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Glory. It's, glad that it's awesome to have both my sons home <laughs> today. Yeah. Friday night they came, or Thursday night they came over, Connor and Sydney, and it's the first time in months that we've had the whole family at the house together. So it was amazing. So here we go. I'm going to preach to you today about uh, a woman at a well. And I'm going to start in John 4. I'm going to go from the uh, New International Version, and we're just going to roll this thing out. Some of you people that get excited, get excited today. I want you to jump up and high-five somebody right beside you right now. Come on, Jimmy. Good. Uh, you pull your back out. <laughs> Okay, here we go. We're going to start with verse 1, and we're going to roll through this, and I'll try to get you out of here fast. Verse 1. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized his disciples. There's something about religious people. They just like to make stuff up. There's the same yesterday, today, and it's going to be the same tomorrow, right? They like to say things about people that just aren't true. Amen? So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he, verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. So I want you to put this in context for a second. Jesus, who, who come from a Jewish descent, has a bunch of Jews, Jew boys, all good Jew boys around him. And now he's going to go through Samaria. And for a Jew boy to go to Samaria would be like some of you guys going downtown Kansas City, you know, where they tell you, yeah, like me and my wife went down there once when we used to party, and they said, you're not supposed to be down here. <laughs> you're too white. <laughs> Some of you, a Jew boy to go through Samaria, they just didn't like him. Like, I, I know that Jesus taught on the good Samaritan, but this was like an offensive message, right? Like Jesus is saying something to offend their religious mind. It is literally like an oxymoron for the Jewish culture to say good Samaritan. It's like, it's like saying uh, a good country song, right? Or a good Steelers game, you know? The only good Steelers game is one they're losing, right? So a Jew boy would never think it would be okay to say, Good Samaritan. Boys, we're not talking about football today. We're talking about good and bad stuff. Matter of fact, I can just imagine Jesus telling Peter, you know, like, hey, we're going to Samaria. And Peter goes, What area? Jesus says, not some area, Samaria, right? Because <laughs> Peter's never been to Samaria. Hallelujah. Verse 5. So he came to a town called Sychar. I don't know if I ever pronounced these right. I didn't go through Bible school. So if it's Sychar or Sychar, near the plot of a ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. First thing I gotta say, I think it's awesome that Jesus was tired. Right? Amen. Sometimes we don't realize that Jesus was fully man. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points. He could sympathize with me when I'm tired, 
And if we really start thinking about what it means that he was tempted at all points, he could get offensive really quick. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I can name a few things, but some of you might get upset here today. But if you think about everything that's bad, Jesus was tempted at all points. Why? Because he could sympathize with me and my temptation. Amen. He was tired. But he came and he sat down by a well. The, before I got started, it says, verse 4, it says that he had to go through Samaria. He was leaving, but he had to make a detour to Samaria. Right? It says that, verse 5, that he came to a town and he sat down by a well. Or verse 6, he sat down by a well because he was tired. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman come to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Verse 8, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said, for you a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman, how can you ask me for a drink? Reminds me of my wife sometimes, you know, like, hey, give me something to drink. Who do you think you are asking me for something to drink, boy? <laughs> you get up and make yourself a drink, son. Except on Father's Day, I go, but it's Father's Day. And she'll go give me something to drink. <laughs> Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God who, and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give him you living water. She says, Sir, the, wo the, wo Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? So I want to stop for just a minute. So Jesus comes along. He has to go to Samaria. He, ha he has to make a detour because he's got a, a divine appointment with a woman, a Samaritan woman, for the religious mind at this time, a Samaritan woman would be like a Muslim woman in our day and age, the way we think about Muslims today. The, Jesus had a, had a divine appointment and he comes and he sits down at a well and he begins to talk to her about, I have living water, right? And her response to him is, is that you don't have a bucket. And I got to thinking about this. How many times has Jesus tried to give us living water? I mean, this is what religion has done to us. Jesus has come to give us life and life more abundantly. He says, if you drink from this water from your belly, you'll flow living waters. And so many times we're, we're so distracted with other things that don't really matter that we never take a drink of the water Jesus has. And we're focused on the bucket. We're focused on getting a bigger bucket, a better bucket. If I can have a nicer car, if I can have a bigger house, if I can have a bigger paycheck, if I can have more, if I can only have more, I'll find that living water flowing inside of me. If I can only get more, if I can have a different wife. All oh, you guys will be looking at me like you're confused at what I'm talking about. If I can have a different husband, if I can have this, I need a bigger bucket. I need this, I need that. And the guy that comes to bring the light, to bring the water, is standing there. And sometimes, you know, I think sometimes we think that. Yeah, but I received Jesus, so I've taken a drink of that water. But I think that this is every day I have to say I want a drink of that water because I can take a drink of that water today on Sunday and tomorrow I'll wake up being focused on the bucket. Are you with me? Like, I can be in this thing for 30 years and lose sight of what it means to be co completely satisfied in Christ Amen. and be chasing after the things that He's promised me and miss the relationship that I'm supposed to have. The source of my joy is in Him and in Him alone. And sometimes I get focused on the bucket. Right? I miss the whole thing, what this is about. The God of the universe. Like, like, like who are we that while we're out looking for buckets, that the God that created the whole universe will come and sit and wait to encounter me? You ever think about that? You see, my whole life, I was chasing after a bigger bucket, a bigger house, a bigger car, a bigger paycheck, more, more, more. If I could only get more, if I could only receive more, if I could only, if, if I just had this, I would actually be happy. And God sat there, God sat there and waited for me. That song she was talking about, he will not relent until he pursues you, 
He is the groom that's pursuing the bride, and he is going to chase you into a corner and, and continue to woo you until you can no longer refuse him anymore, until you fully receive him. And I'm not just talking about just being saved. I'm talking about being fully satisfied in Christ and in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Shaka! Wakey, wakey. Hallelujah. I have to get my crocodile dundee knife out. Wakey, wakey. It says that she waited till noon. Do you know why she waited till noon? There, there's significance in that. See, there, if you think about the Middle East, the Middle East is very hot, right? And so the women during that time would either go early in the morning or go late in the evening, right? Unless you're a woman that was not of a good reputation, you would go when nobody else was there, which would be at noon, when the sun was at its highest and when it was hot. But she didn't want, she wanted to go to a place where at a time when people wouldn't be there so they wouldn't see her, right? Yeah. But Jesus says, I'm going to go to the, I have to go to Samaria. I have to meet this woman. I've got a divine appointment that's more important than anything else i got going on today. I have to go here. I have to be here right now. From a woman that says that she, the woman that go that, that goes at a time when she will not encounter anybody. Here we go. What's my place? What verse was I on? Does anybody know? Did I read verse twelve? No. Okay, verse twelve. Are you greater? So, so let me read verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and a well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Verse 12. Are you greater? So she asked Jesus. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Like, who do you think you are? Right? Are you greater than Jacob? And he's like, well, I created Jacob. But yeah, whatever you think. Verse 14. Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw. And he told her, he told her, verse 16, Go call your husband and come back. She says, I have no husband. Jesus says, you are right when you say you have no husband. Verse 18, the fact is, is that you have five, had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. The reason I shared this today is because the movie, I watched that movie, The Shack, the other day, and it made me think about what, what we think God's like. I think one of the reasons people had a problem with the movie is because I mean, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin it for you, but what happened in the movie was was the thing that would happen that everybody, the, the criminal, if you will, or the bad guy, is the, is everybody would be in agreement that we should kill this guy, right? Everybody, I think if it happened to your kid, you would be, you would be in full agreement, we should hunt this guy down. But when he goes and meets with wisdom, wisdom says, shows like, hey, this guy is only reacting out of what he grew up with. Right, and so I begin to think about, you know, Jesus, God is not the one. He, like, like we try to wrap our mind around how can He forgive everything? How can He have grace for the whole world? You know, I think that we don't even fully wrap our mind around this. Is that Jesus has the work of the cross has like the entire every human every human is forgiven. Like there is not one person going to go to hell for sin. No, not one person. On the face of this, or some of you are going to freak out right now because all you see happening in hell is, is about sin and about not sin. Right? Either Jesus was the one sacrifice for sin forever, or he was the one sacrifice for partial sin for part time. Jesus was the one sacrifice for sin forever. An unbeliever is forgiven. You just don't know it yet. So, why are you saying this, Pastor? Why, how could God do that? That's scandalous. Some of you right now are looking at me going, unbelievers are forgiven of sin? Some of you are like, you say, well, what sends us to hell? What sends you to hell? Rejecting 
the one sacrifice for sin forever. Amen. You know, uh, C.S. Lewis said one time, he says, forgiven sinner, forgiven people, uh, how do you say it? There will be forgiven people in hell. Amen. Right? So what, what's the whole purpose of this whole thing? If, if everybody's forgiven, I want to say this real quick. I'm going to make this disclaimer before I get going because sometimes I get going and you're going to go say that I said things that I didn't say. I'm not saying I believe everybody's going to heaven. Okay? But I am saying that I believe everybody's forgiven. And I've never believed, I don't believe from the beginning of time sin had anything to do with you going to hell. I think from the beginning of time it was always about you rejecting or receiving God. And even the Old Testament, the, priest, the problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees were is because they thought that they were living for God, but the reality of it was they were living. He, said, he called them. He says, your father is the devil. This is what he tells the guys that are that are been studying to be teachers of the law from the time they were born. He tells them their father is of the devil. Right? This is what his problem was because they didn't understand what this was about. And so Jesus confronts this woman. And he comes up to her and he says, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right, you had five husbands, but the one you're with now is not your husband. Is he doing it because he's trying to make her feel get bad or convict her? No, he's trying to get right to the heart of the matter, right? Like, like let's talk about the bucket. She, you know, she, she was saying, you don't have a bucket. He says, I'm going to give you living water. She says, you don't have a bucket. Why? Why is she going after all these men? Because she's been looking for buckets in the wrong places, right? What's that old song? Looking for love in all the wrong places, right? She's married five times. Where does love come from? From God. He's trying to tell her, I'm here to heal what's inside of you. The water that I'm going to give you is going to satisfy you, right? What I loved about the movie was is that, that we would see the people that they showed there, and most of us would say they deserve hell. And God looks, and I absolutely agree with the movie. Maybe that's what offends people, but God looks at it and He says, No, I know what's going on inside of them. I know what happened to them. It's easy for me to judge you. It's easy for me to see Kenny fall off in sin and say, You better straighten up. You better act better. But I haven't. I haven't seen all the way the depths of, 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 what, of what Kitty's been through in his life, but my Heavenly Father says that there's nothing hidden from his sight. He has seen, he sees everything, and he understands why we respond and why we react this way. And so what did he do? The very barrier that we thought that was holding us back from God was sin, and he, he wiped the whole thing away, and he says, now there's nothing left. There's no, there's no longer a barrier that holds you back from me, Right? Now we can get on to the real thing that I wanted to do. That's have a relationship. And when I have a relationship with you, you can throw all your buckets away, right? Like, like it's like this. She was going to a well to get water, right? But a well actually came to her to give her the water that she really needed, right? But let's go one chapter over. You guys know the story about the guy that was at the uh, the pool of Bethesda? I said that right? It's close. He's, the guy's there and Jesus goes up to him and he says that nobody will put me in the water. Like he says, when the angel comes, he stirs the water, and if you get if you're the first person in, you get healed. Right? It's kind of like religion, right? If you're the first one, you get you get the golden ticket. Amen. Right? If you're the first person in, you get healed. So what happens is it's the living water, he can't get to the water, so the living water comes to him. Amen. Like, she's at a well, hiding, trying to get water that's never going to satisfy her. And, the, and Jesus, who would never hide from her, if she had a hundred husbands, if she ran a brothel, if she had murdered half the guys that she had been with, he would still be there that day, saying to her that, I am the well. I am the well. You don't need a bucket. You just need a drink. Right? Sometimes we're, we get so, we get so, last week I talked about social media, we get so fixated on social media, we get so fixated on things that don't matter because we're not drinking from the right well. We're so distracted and we're so caught off over here and caught off over there and this is important and that's important. And what I say last week, and the enemy comes and he snatches away things that really make a difference, that really mean something. Amen. Shaka. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, Papa. So what does Jesus do? He, 
She wants to have all, she continues. She continues. Can you go to the next verse? She continues. The second that he gets to the heart of it, so she's, she's already avoiding the discussion. So, he, so Jesus, this is what he does with it sometimes. He goes right to the heart of the issue and says, where's your husband at? Right? And she says, I don't have a husband. He says, right. We go back one verse. So what does she do? She gets religious with him. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Right? So sometimes when, when the preacher's preaching, it starts getting to the core of the reality. We want to start th having discussions about things about the Bible because we don't really want to get to the core of what's going on in our hearts. Right? Go on. First one. Our saint ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman. Can I share something with you? This is the longest discussion between a person and Jesus recorded in the Bible. And we don't even know her name. We know there's the woman at the well. The writers, the Holy Ghost thought that this story was important enough. The longest discussion Jesus had with a person that was recorded, they thought it was important enough to put in the Bible, but they didn't think it was important enough to give you the woman's name. You want to think that they did that for? Because the Bible says that we're the bride of Christ. I think most of us can probably relate with this woman. I think if most of us are really honest with ourselves, we can say, yeah, I, sometimes I wake up on Monday and I'm not drinking from the living water, I'm worried about the bucket. Right? Maybe Monday I wake up and, I, and I'm drinking from the living water. I've got my worship music on going to work. And by Friday I've got the worship music on. I've got 93.3 The Eagle War. Right? Listen to Quiet Riot. Worried about the bucket. Worried about something that doesn't make a... I can't say in church. I don't stone interpret for me. <laughs> Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. Can I say something about that? You know when Jesus came, it says that the law came with the law came through Moses. But grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. For some reason, if you start talking about grace, that grace came through Jesus, people are going to be quick to remind you it wasn't just grace. It's grace and truth. And what they're really saying is this. Is Jesus came with grace. But the truth of it is, if you don't straighten out, that grace is going to run out. Really what they're saying is, they would never say this because it's a contradiction in their own mind. But this is what they really believe, that Jesus came with grace and the law. Grace and more rules. Grace, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to send you to hell. Yeah, he gave you grace to get you out of your mess. But if you go back to that mess, the truth is, is you're going to stay in that mess. You know the truth that Jesus came to reveal was? I started it out. He came to reveal to you. He came with grace. He says he came with grace upon grace. That word there is piled upon. Grace piled up on grace. What did he come? What's the truth that he came with? He, he says, you guys didn't know the Father. None of you have known the Father. If you see me, you've seen the Father. I've come with the truth of what he really looks like. I heard Bill Johnson say, what's well, Jesus' perfect theology? You know theology? I know everybody says, I don't need theology, I got Jesus. Theology is a study of God. Atheists have a theology. They've studied God and don't believe in Him. Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is the perfect study of God. So what does the Father look like? Well, what does Jesus look like? How did He handle sinners? He loved them. How did He deal with sickness? Did He say, I'm going to give you cancer until you get your slack straight. I'm going to give you cancer because you're not paying your tithe. Um, everywhere Jesus went, He healed them. And how did He deal with storms? He ceased storms. He didn't, 
you know, the stuff, you know, God sent a storm to bring him bring to repentance. I look at Jesus and say, this can't be it. That's not my fault. This is the truth. We worship Him in spirit. Why? Because by spirit, he said, there's a time coming when we worship Him in spirit, when my spirit and His spirit become one and in truth. The truth of what? Of who He really is. Of who my Father really is. For they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Those that those that have the Spirit in them and those who know who He really is, the Father seeking them. Why? Because He wants to have a relationship with you. And as long as you think God is some deity that wants to strike you down, you'll never have a relationship with Him. But when you realize that He's your heavenly Papa and He wants nothing but the best for you. You see in that movie, the, the guy, they put the guy on the judgment seat and they let him judge who goes to hell and who goes to heaven. And then they brought his two kids up and they say, you pick which one goes to hell, which one goes to heaven. And he says, I can't. I can't make that choice. I can't pick. And he says, I'll die in their place. You take me instead. You see, Jesus says that I'd rather die than live without you. All my creation. The girl that's got five husbands living with the sixth. The one that was caught in adultery, thrown at his feet. Go to verse 24. God is spirit, and worship must worship him in the spirit and in truth. Back up for a second. You can't even worship him. Like, you can't worship God if you think God is a deity that's trying to, that, that it, you know, we used to talk about this a lot. The flowers, like, he loves me, he don't love me. This is how we think God is with us. I'm going to heaven, I'm going to hell. I'm going to heaven, I'm going to hell. How do you worship that? Like, how do you worship that from your heart? You know what I mean? Like, when I come into worship, I don't worship to get, I, I mean, it does something for me, but, I, but when I think about the goodness of God, Worship just bubbles up out of me. Right? When I know the truth of who He is and what He's done in, done for me, what He continues to do for me, what He's done in my family's life, what He's done in my mom and dad's life, what He's done in people's life in here, and I think about how good He is, it's like, it's like He's better than I can wrap my mind around. And worship just comes out. I just can't help it. I'll be standing in the line at Walmart and be just going, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. And the lady in front of me looks at me like, there's something wrong with me. And there is something wrong with me, but it's none of her business. She turned back around. <laughs> you see, I remember as a kid, I went to some pretty legalistic churches growing up. I remember as a kid that praise and worship was demanded out of you. You better worship God. You want to beat the, you want to beat the devil? Praise God. But I had to get right with him before I could even praise him, right? Okay, let's go to verse 25. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, can you imagine he's having this conversation with her? He's like, like she's, she's experiencing something and he's like, I, I am the one. I am he that you're talking about. He didn't come like they thought he was going to come. They thought he was going to ride into Jerusalem on a white horse, overthrow the Roman Empire, and set up the Israelites as a new, uh, that they were going to take back over Israel, and they were going to have him as their king, and they were going to have the rule of David again. They were seeing everything in the natural. But instead, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He died a sinner's death, and he restored the kingdom of God on the earth. Verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were, and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, this is where I wanted to get to. You see, she got a water jar. She's worried about Jesus' bucket. We sometimes worry about our buckets. We're worried about, about things that don't matter. After she encounters Jesus, and after she after she takes a drink of living water, 
She puts down a thing that doesn't matter. She went back to town and said to the people, verse 29, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? In verse 30. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. What I love about this is, is she came to a well, she met a well, and then she became a well. Amen. The Bible says that the men, and I believe it was John 1, that the light came into the world, and when men seen the light, they became enlightened. Right? When she drank from that water, she went back in town. This is the lady that, that avoided everybody because they gossiped about her and they talked about her. And she was the she was the loose one. She was the one with all the husbands and living in, out of uh, out of wedlock right now. She is that one. But when she goes back into town, something had changed about her. That when she began to talk about this Messiah, something splashed up on them. And it, by, it goes on to say they followed her back out to talk to Jesus. Hallelujah. Scott was talking about this this morning. About if we really know the love of the Father and what He's done for us and what He's going to do through us, that we we can't help but just be servants of others, to love others, to hold them up above ourselves. And that really, real joy, truly, real joy comes from that and that alone. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for my Heavenly Father. I'm thankful that uh, He's good. It's better than we think. Amen. Amen. Can, we, can we get the dads to stand up in here today and recognize them? Maybe come up here. We just have a few. I we don't have all our kiddos here today, so. If your dad's up here, will you come up here and stand by? If you are a single moment here, I want you to come up here too. Laura? What? Come on, Laura. Single mamas could come up here. Come on, if you've had to fill the role of both parents, come up here. If you guys would, would you guys come up here and just pray for all the... Are you a single mama? Yes. Come up here. <laughs> Told you I would call you out today, but I lied to you. Thank you, Father. Kick us off some music. Thank you, sir. All right, all right. You just come up here and even if you... you, you I don't care. Just, just get with somebody, pray with them, tell them that you appreciate them. Speak words of life into them. Uh, encourage them. I just want to say I'm thankful for the men. I, I remember when we started this church seven and a half years ago that there was two men in the church. And then shortly after that, Kenny came. We had three men. And for a long time, we had about 15 women and three men in the church. And I, I, I've always felt like that, you know, it starts that God's made men the, the head of the household. And when we can... When we can lead in, in uh, worshiping God, our kids will look at us as they grow up and they'll know who. So if you guys would pray with your pray with the men, uh, pray with your dads, speak to your dads, hug your dads, love your dads, whatever whatever it is you feel led to do.